Some of the words in this morning's gospel may put you in mind of Jimmy Carter some time ago about sinning in your heart. But what I find really interesting is it fascinates me that in this age when everyone seems to ignore bits of the law or at least think it doesn't apply to them, that we run into Jesus saying this, sitting on a rock and saying, not so fast, folks. I mean, even driving into church this morning, I think I counted three California stops and one completely blowing through a, 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 a red light on the way. So let's not even go into the smash and grabs these days or uh, the catalytic converter thieves. I had Gary check because we had to leave our car here this week to make sure we had one when we, when we came back. Or, or worst of all, though, the crimes of physical violence of one person against another. Jesus, however, makes it pretty clear in chapter 5 of the gospel who he is. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. He's not abandoning, he's enhancing. We need to listen and understand what is expected of us as Jesus believers in his day and in this day. Uh, Reverend, a Reverend Angela Wells is a UCC pastor down in Naples, Florida, who says that Jesus in, is in trying not to abolish the law or draw people away from it, but quite the opposite. He reinforces it and actually holds people to a higher standard than what the law dictates. He's taking it to a whole other level. I should warn you that today I may be seeing, saying some things that are might upset some of us as I do, but I think we need to talk about it, and I'm wondering when I would say it. Jesus, Jesus manages in just this one gospel to deal with all those sins, with family fights, murder, legal arguments, indebtedness, swearing, major league hanky-panky, and that perennial third rail of sin, divorce. We can assume that the people who are listening in this week's gospel are the same people who were sitting last week for the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, where we had all the, blessed are you who are meek in heart, blessed are you for this, blessed are you for that, and the pronouncement that we are all the salt of the earth. But we can pretty much gather that Jesus is going to add another blessedness onto this week. Blessed are you who don't make the assumption that you're all that good in a bag of chips. As Reverend Wells says, he was telling his followers that law must not, the law must not be a litmus test for whether we are good or moral and ethical beings, but that we set for ourselves a higher standard. In other words, you shouldn't go up to bed at night reflecting on your day and pat yourself on the back for not committing murder or stealing or committing adultery that day. Yay, you. That's a lot of, there's a lot of other stuff to take a look at in that that happens in your day. What Jesus is doing and is teaching us is that building relationships and not destroying relationships because of the law is what God wants. A uh, Lutheran pastor that I, I frequently uh, uh, quote here, David Losey, has uh, three elements, he says, we need to look at uh, in the law. First, the law is always given as a gift. I think that's kind of beautiful. God gives us the law as a gift. And the commandments are like life's little education, instruction book, to help us get more out of life not to be thrown in a drawer and ignored. The law is not the means by which to become God's people or earn God's love, but a gift given to all God's people because God loves them and we should love all of us. It is a gift. It's not <clears throat> something that we earn. It is a gift to us. Second, the law is given to strengthen community our community. 
It's not about meeting individual needs, but about sustaining a community. The focus is very simple, and if you think back about it. When, you, when you're looking out for yourself, it's you against the world. When you're looking out for others in your community, they, in turn, look out for you. Think of those all, all, all people at the four-way stop are really looking out for you if they do stop. It's the community together that faces the challenges and setbacks and also the, the promises of the future. Third, the law comes as a gift to strengthen community by orient us, orienting us to the needs of our neighbor. It's meant to draw us closer. The law doesn't simply draw moral boundaries. Instead, it alerts us to the responsibility to care for those, those around us. Now, if you think back over all of the stories we've discussed about, stories about Jesus, you'll, you'll know. Sometimes to live the, with the, the law, you have to sometimes ease up on the law. Remember the widow with the bad back who was bent over in half, and he, she was in the, in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he healed her. The priests were livid because he healed on the Sabbath. Remember the time he and his disciples were traveling on the Sabbath through a field, and they were all very hungry, so they stopped, and what little grain was left they picked. And once the, the pre, priests were, again, angry because they were working on the Sabbath. They were laboring on the Sabbath. That was against the law. And what did Jesus say at that point, if you remember? He said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made to be a blessing, <clears throat> not a burden. And when the Pharisees protested that Jesus had not lived to the letter of the dietary law in, in, in the Jewetary, Jewish dietary law, he instructed them this, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. If only you see the law as moral boundaries, one can too, too easily, <clears throat> as Losey says, discriminate, injure, neglect, or speak poorly of a neighbor, all the while being proud of how I have kept the law. Unfortunately, this is what we are seeing played out when we encounter the so-called followers, followers of Christian nationalism. You know, you've seen, seen proponents uh, this week of Christian nationalism. Uh, just among the, the, a handful of people in Congress who hooted and hollered and insulted the president. These are people who are trying to start a biblically inspired overthrow of government. Often, when they speak, they use religious symbols. That's how you can kind of tell they're going there. Religious symbols to make their point. In case in point, Sarah Sanders this week said, quote, Democrats are forcing the country to worship false idols. When you start to hear the religion coming over into politics, pay attention. We must be aware when that happens. Author Jamar Tisby wrote a, a fascinating book about Christian nationalism. And he said this, Christian nationalism uses religious symbolism to create, quote, a permissive structure, close quote, for the acquisition of political power and social control that exists to reinforce the worldview that practices it. Sadly, one of the commercials I've enjoyed so much these last months, and it'll be on the Super Bowl today too, is the one that shows Jesus as an outcast and a foreigner, which he was. And the announcer says, Jesus gets us. Jesus. I love that. I thought it was really cool. Unfortunately, I found out recently that despite the truthful depiction of Jesus, everything they're saying about Jesus is correct. These ads are being used as a carrot and stick, an entree <clears throat> by a far-right group of anonymous investors whose founder opposes the rights of LGBT people and whose anti-abortion stance includes denying birth control to his employees and who believes most 
horribly in structural racism. In other words, the races are supposed to be laddered with the white on top. And gender equality. Those are his stands. So if you watch the Super Bowl, you'll see two of these ads today that are run by the Signatary, that's the name of the group. And they have paid for these as part of a $300 million campaign. I'm so disappointed because I originally thought it was the real Jesus that they were really trying to worship. Now, <clears throat> going from one, <coughs> one point of, of descent into another, it's a good number of clergy who will not uh, preach about Jesus' words on divorce today. But I feel it's a must for everyone to understand what Jesus is doing with all these laws is improving them so they fit the current culture. Jesus is one person, I can guarantee you, who, who understood what a woman is and what a woman can do. His statements in this gospel were squarely aimed not at the women, but at the men around him. You see, in the, in the culture of the time, women were not only subordinates, in reality, they were not even really seen as treated much as human. And because, that was because of the way the law was set up. Any man seeking to get rid of his wife, perhaps for a newer model, simply had to go to the rabbi and complain about her performance. It could be something as simple as burning the roast. And he could go to the rabbi and the rabbi would grant him a get, that's what a, a divorce is called, and the right to remarry. But this is an example when we talk about what can be destructive to a community. What this meant for the woman was devastation. By law, she could own nothing, nothing. And without a, without a husband to care for her, she had no place to live, nothing to eat for her or her children, and most often became a burden on the community, who sometimes stoned her, and at the best would help her survive with handouts. Jesus' condemnation of divorce is aimed at the men of the time. Women deserve to be respected, Jesus says. Women deserve to be respected. My Saugata colleague, Reverend Allison Buttrick Patton, says that revising the Jewish law of the time, Jesus is kicking things up a notch. The reign of God is coming, and the bar is set higher for human relationships. In God's realm, and especially these days when spousal abuse is so prevalent, we must love one another, not because the law demands it, or commands it, but because every person is inherently worthy of love. We all belong to God and to each other. That's God's vision for God's beloved community. God forgives broken promises. God gives us hope for the future. And as the Dalai Lama has said, Love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. If we live the letter of the law, we live the love that has set the entire universe into being. You and I are part of that wonderful spiral of life that is a valentine to God. Amen. I wish you reconciliation. That's what this week's about, whether it's Ukraine or your relationships or your neighbors or your family. I hope you will be the person who steps forward to offer a hand of forgiveness, forgiving for yourself and forgiving for the other people in your life, because we're not perfect, as we said today. That's okay. As Jesus would say, we're perfect enough. So with that, I send you forth. May, uh, 
May God give you and direct you this week to people who can make that happen. Is there someone in your life right now that you think of that maybe you're not at peace with? I remember a family when I was in hospital administration. Four senior, they were all in their late 80s, members of the same family who would not talk to one another. And one of the sisters was starting to die. Finally, and they wouldn't talk to one another. Finally, I took them aside. I wasn't in this role, but I ended up doing it. And said, look, pretty soon you're not going to have a chance to take care of this and to heal it. And do you know that, I didn't know whether they'd listen, but a year later they came back after their sister had passed and said, thank you. We actually were able to pull it together. So whoever you have in your life, whether it's a small beef or a big beef or a suit, lawsuit or whatever, step forward this week and see what you can do to bring peace. May God bless you and give you peace all this week. Amen. Thank you.